Oh, it's great to be back with you. I'll tell you, uh, for all of our friends out there we've met, it's, it's great to be here. And for all the friends out there that uh, we haven't met yet, but you're still our friends, it's great to be with you too to do that. For those of you who may not know, uh, a little over a year and a half or so, the church kicked me out. No, they didn't kick me out. Uh, we decided to retire because I personally felt in my heart, at least for a pastor, that it's better for you to start thinking about retirement before the church starts thinking about retirement for you. And so, uh, and so it was good to do that. And so Lee and I went in business together. We are now professional grandparents, and uh, we're having a great time in Southern California. We have nine grandkids. Six of them live in Southern California and three of them in Texas. And so, uh, you know, kind of weighing, you know, California, Texas. But I'm a native Californian. Lee's a native Texan. And uh, it was hard. But, um, you know, I gave in to her and we're staying in California. So uh, (laughs) it it is good to be back with you. And I was so honored that Pastor Dan thought to ask me to help the the preaching during the time that he's on vacation. I got a text from him last night. I'm not sure where he is, but it's somewhere with a beach and a really beautiful sunset. And so it's a well-deserved vacation for him, and I hope he and his family get all the rest they need and come back uh, recharged. Um, You know, um, Lee and I pray regularly for you, and it's great to come back and see that you're doing so well and that God is in the midst of you and that God is working with you. Now, I have the privilege of being with you for two Sundays. Pastor Dan asked if I could stay for two Sundays, and we're beholden to Sandy King for allowing us to camp out at her house between the two Sundays, and so uh, we're going to be doing that. But I thought since I'm going to be here for two Sundays that I would kind of tie both of the messages, the sermons, together. So you get to hear part one uh, this Sunday, and then you have to come back next Sunday and hear part two uh, in terms where you're coming back and bring a friend with you because it's mutually Uh, beneficial, just the sermon itself. But I thought I would tie both sermons together with a common theme. Now, since I've retired, I've had the privilege of being able to read the Bible just for fun. I know that sounds funny to you maybe, but read the Bible. But it just seems like while I was pastoring, that every time I picked up the Bible and stuff that I was, I was studying for a sermon or a Bible study or something, to, and without all those pressures and things uh, from that now, I have the opportunity just to pick up the Bible and just to read the Bible just, just for fun. In fact, in, in this year and a half or so that I've been retired, I've actually read through the entire Bible two, two times. And it's out of those times that I've been reading through the Bible that, you know, God still speaks. Even if you're just reading the Bible for fun, the, the Bible still reads you, right? And, and the Bible was just speaking to me. And it just seemed like all through the Bible, there were these two words that kept cropping up. In fact, I would say maybe these are the two most important words in the Bible. And they, they pop up. They occur both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they occur numerous times uh, throughout the Bible, So, uh, you know, it's amazing how many parts of the Bible just cling to you. You know, you can read it over and over again, but then new things just kind of pop out to you. And, um, And so I came across these two words, two most important words in all of the Bible, and they are the words, but God, but God. Now, I've shown these two words along with a mathematical symbol. And those of you who aren't mathematicians, maybe you don't recognize this mathematical symbol. But this mathematical symbol is called a maplet, and sometimes it's called a maps to symbol. And what I'm trying to show in this, in this um, logo that I have up here, the, these two important words of the Bible, uh, uh, is that uh, everything on the left side of a but God leads to bad things. And everything on the right side of a but God leads to good things. You know, on one side of a but God, it, it, it maps to fear, despair, destruction, brokenness, and death. But on the right side of a but God, it maps to peace, hope, salvation, renewal, and life. And in between those two, two options, those two things in our life, there's, there's a but God. And it's found all over the Bible. Those two words make all the difference in the world. They stand between what's bad and what's good, between bondage and between freedom, between life and between death. Those two words stand there. And you see them again and again in Scripture if you're looking for them. 
For example, in Genesis chapter 6 and 7, where we read about the flood of Noah, the text reads this way. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 24, and then in chapter 8 and verse 1, it says this. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Left side of the but God, we see destruction, judgment, and on the right side, we see forgiveness and grace. And look at what the wise woman of Tekoa said to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 14. She said, all of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. On the left side, death. On the right side, grace. And in Psalm 73 and verse 26, the psalmist said this, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Left side, weakness. Right side, strength. And I like... I like this one. I don't know if I have it on the screen or not, but, but it's everywhere in the Bible. In Acts chapter uh, 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 3 and verse 15, Peter and John are preaching to the citizens of Jerusalem, and this is what they said. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. I like that. You killed him, but God raised him up. Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, is one of the greats. It says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Without a but God in your life, there's no hope. So this week and next week too, I want to look at two important but God verses in the Bible. One in the Old Testament and the other in the the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it'll help us see today the invisible hand of God, and the second found in the New Testament helps us see God's immeasurable riches. Now, find in your Bibles this morning, Genesis chapter 50, if you have them, and there's the verses that we're going to look at on the screen in just a few moments. Uh, We're going to look at verses 19 and 20 of Genesis chapter 50, But uh, before we look at that, I want to give you a little bit of context of what we're we're going to be looking at before we look at this important but God verse in the Bible. You know, the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis has to be an important one. It has to be important. This is how I know it has to be important. Because it takes just two chapters to tell us that God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, but the story of Joseph takes up 14 chapters in the book of Genesis. I mean, it's a big story. It's a headliner. And if, you, if you've read that story, you'll remember that Joseph is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And you know that Jacob's name was later changed to Israel. So what we're really talking about, the sons of of Jacob, we're talking about the patriarchs, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, that's there, Jacob's sons. Now the Bible tells us that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son and he showed favoritism to him. Now, as parents, we're not supposed to do that, right? You're not supposed to show favoritism, but Jacob wasn't a perfect parent, neither are you, but he had his favorite, and Joseph was his favorite. And Jacob gave, had made and gave Joseph a coat of many colors, and a special coat like that was a symbol of a father's favor and love, and it was usually reserved for the eldest son, which Joseph was not the eldest son. But Jacob, showing favoritism to Joseph, gave him this coat of many colors. And so, nevertheless, he, uh, you know, he got the coat, and uh, when he got the coat, it made his brothers jealous of him. Because it was, a, it was an outward symbol that daddy always liked you best. And Joseph didn't help matters for himself either, because God gave Joseph dreams. And in one of the dreams... Um, he shared with his father and his brothers. And the interpretation of the dream was this, that one day, Jacob and the other 11 brothers would come and they would bow before Joseph. 
Joseph would be over them and they would bow before him. Now, I don't know about you. I don't, I don't know. I, I question the wisdom of Joseph of sharing this interpretation of the dream with his father and with his brothers. But nevertheless, it made matters worse. And his brothers became so enraged, so angry with Joseph that they plotted to kill him. And they would have killed him except for the eldest son, Reuben, got wind of the plot and he said, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just beat him up real bad and throw him in a pit and then we'll do something else with him. And later the brothers sold him into slavery. And, um, and so Joseph had a hard time. You know, we could talk about our dysfunctional families, but few of them rise to the level of Jacob's family, right? I mean, few of us have, have been treated like that in our families. So back to Joseph. Years go by. Decades go by. And Joseph is still in Egypt 22 years go by and Jacob and his sons find themselves in need because there was a famine where they lived in the land of Canaan and so they decided to go to Egypt and buy some grain because they heard there was plenty there. But when they arrive in Egypt, the person that they have to go before and ask for life-saving food is none other than Joseph himself. And they don't know it's Joseph. He's changed so much. And he's indoctrinated in the culture of Egypt so much, they don't recognize him, but Joseph recognizes his brothers. He knows who they are. Now remember I said this story takes up 14 chapters, so you're going to kind of the condensed version of what happens. Eventually, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, and they all weep like little girls. <laughs> and then the brothers go home to get their father and their younger brother and they bring them to Egypt, and Joseph, with Pharaoh's permission, gives them the land of Goshen, which, by the way, they lived in the land of Goshen for 430 years before returning to Canaan. Anyway, while they're in Goshen, Jacob dies at the ripe old age of 147 years old, and Joseph and his brothers bury him next to Leah, his wife, in the cave of Machpelah. And after the death of their father, the brothers get a little bit nervous because they said, you know, while our father was alive, that's what was standing between Joseph's revenge and us. And now that our father is dead, Joseph is going to take care of business. Joseph is going to get his revenge on us. And so they manufacture a lie. They go to Joseph and they tell Joseph that while our father was still alive, um, he, uh, he sent a message that he wants us to give to you before he died. Now, the nowhere in the Bible did it ever say that Jacob gave the brothers a message to give to Joseph, and nowhere does it say this, and so I, I believe they made it up. They lied, and they come and they say, here's what our father said, Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. So here's the thing. Years ago, Joseph had already forgiven them. Joseph had already expressed his love to them and everything, but they were still carrying the weight of the guilt of their sin with them for all of those years. And they thought they had to lie their way out of it. They thought they could take matters in their own hands and lie way out of it. And so they made up this lie that their father said, Joseph, I want you to forgive your brothers. He's no longer there. Now here's the thing we need to grasp today. When that message came to Joseph, the Bible says that he wept. And while he was crying, his brothers came and threw themselves down before him and said, we are your slaves. Now comes our verse in Genesis chapter 50, verses 19 and 20. And look at what it says. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. On the one side of the but God was sin, selfishness, and intention to harm, and on the other side, uh, on, on the left side, the same side of that but God was betrayal of his brothers, a bruising beating, and a profiteering by human trafficking, but God took everything on the left side and used it to bring about good on the right side of the but God. On the right side every, is everything we could hope for in a fulfilling life. On the right side is position, is power, is plenty, and even restoration with family. What a difference those two words make, but God. You meant it for harm, but God 
meant it for good. Now I want us to think for just a few moments about what we can learn from those two words, but God. What are some insights that we can draw from that? Here's the first one that I want you to understand. When there's a but God, it helps us see the providence of God in our lives. There's an unseen hand guiding our lives. We get a glimpse of that hand in those words, but God. Even when you don't feel it, even when you don't see it, even when you don't even believe it, God is working. He's always working. He never stops working. You know, there's a recap of the life of Joseph in the book of Acts, chapter 7 and verse 9. It says this, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him. Acts 7, 9, but God was with him. God's providence in our lives is evident not only when we look, is evident in our lives only when we look back. You don't necessarily see the providence of God in your life right now, but when you stop and look back, you see the providence of God in your life. Providence isn't like a miracle. Miracles occur when God works outside the natural laws. Miracles are immediate and evident in the moment they occur. When God heals the sick, he works outside the natural laws of physics, physiology, and he brings immediate healing to somebody. When Jesus uses two loaves and five fish to feed over 5,000 people, that's outside the natural laws of possibility. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that was outside the laws of life and death. When Jesus walked on the water, that broke the natural laws, and those were miracles. But in Joseph's life, God didn't use miracles. He didn't perform miracles. God's providence guided Joseph. Divine providence is God working within the natural laws. Miracles are God working outside the natural laws. Providence is God working within the natural laws. They are natural, ordinary things about our lives that God uses in extraordinary ways. I heard someone say, miracles are supernatural and divine providence is supernatural. You get the difference? Providence is natural laws being used in super ways. It's God taking the ordinary and making it extraordinary. And divine providence is how God chooses to work in our lives most of the time. You say, I'm waiting for a miracle for God to do. Well, don't rule out the divine providence of God in your life. That's the way God works. His unseen hand is guiding your life, using the natural things in such a way so as to bring about a good result in your life. And let me tell you this about divine providence. Divine providence is a matter of faith. You're not going to understand or you're not going to accept divine providence except by faith. It's believing that God is at work even when I don't know what's going on. Even when it seems like things are really bad and life is falling apart, divine providence is the faith that God is in control and my life is in his hands. That's divine providence. It's a matter of faith. Providence is looking back and seeing God's footprints in the sands carrying you when you couldn't walk on your own. It's seeing how everything in your life has been used to make you strong and better able to live a full and meaningful life that God has for you. One of the greatest verses affirming God's providence is found in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Many of you have memorized this verse and it says, and we know that all things... In all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. That's divine providence. God uses all things in our life for his good purposes. Someone, maybe it's you today, needs to be reminded that what you're going through right now hasn't escaped God's sight. He knows, he cares. He's right there working things out for the good. His divine providence. God's divine providence, his invisible hand is guiding you toward his good purposes for your life and 
also using your life to help in the life of others. So, but God helps us know, helps us see that there is an invisible hand. There is the providence of God at work in our lives. But there's a second truth that we need to see. A but God changes our perspective whenever we're facing hardships. Because of those two words in Scripture, we can be assured that God is always with us. That's the perspective that we need to have. He is with us in the good times of life, and guess what? He is with you in the bad times of life. He is always with you. When you think about Joseph, Joseph's life, you have to conclude that he knew his share of hardships. He knew his share of disappointments. He knew his share of heartaches and heartbreaks. But he never gave up on God. He never stopped believing that God was in control, that God was on his throne, and that he was in charge of what was happening. Joseph had faith to believe. He had the perspective that God was with him always. You know, lately I've been going through a devotional centered around trusting God in the dark. That's what it's called, trusting God in the dark. Trusting God when you can't see and know what's going on and stuff in your life. And it's mainly a reflection on the truths that we learn from the book of Habakkuk. And the prophet himself is dismayed and he's questioning God concerning the news that the godless nation of Babylon will be used to bring judgment on the nation of Israel. And Habakkuk can't believe that God would use such a godless nation, such an evil people, uh, to bring about his judgment on the people that he loves. He just can't believe it. He doesn't know what's going on. He's in the dark. He's heartbroken. He doesn't understand. And yet in the dark, he says this in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Let me ask you, do you have a but the Lord kind of faith? But the Lord the world may seem upside down, but the Lord is still there. When you have nowhere else to turn, when your own ideas and resources have evaporated, when your control over a situation is in shambles, God is still there. When your knees ache from kneeling in prayer and you can't even tell if God is listening, God is still there. No matter what happens in your life, the Lord is in his holy temple. God is still sitting on the throne of the universe, and that ought to change your perspective whenever you face hardships. There's a verse that should change your perspective when you're facing hardships found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. It says this, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity, but God, well, there it is. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. You know that in the Greek language, the original language that the New Testament was written in, that word for temptation, pyrosmos, pyrosmos, temptation in the Greek language, could also be translated not just a temptation, like we're being tempted to sin or something like that, but it can also be translated as some kind of a test or a trial. When you go through some kind of a test or you go through some kind of a trial, there has no trial come upon you but what is common to humanity, but God is faithful. God is there. God won't permit you to go through any kind of a trial or any kind of a test or any kind of a temptation that you're not able to bear because he's right there with you and he's lifting you up. But God helps us see the providence of God and it ought to change our perspective whenever we're facing hardships in our life. And then here's the last thing. A but God reveals to us God's ultimate purpose. Look again at what Joseph told his brothers. Look at that focus verse in Genesis 50. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? I'm not in control here, Joseph says. I'm not sitting on the throne. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Hey, in case you don't know it, Maybe this is a spoiler if you haven't read all the Bible, but God is in the saving business. He's in the saving business. That's what his business is. 
And when Jesus came to earth, the Bible says the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. God's in the seeking and the saving business. That, that's his business. And he fulfills his business. He fulfills his purpose using our lives. God is a God of purpose, and he does all things according to his purpose, and that includes your life. You're not here by accident. You know, the big questions of, of life that we have is, what am I here for? You're here because God wants you here, and God wants to use you, and God has a purpose for your life. God loves you, and he has a purpose for your life, and he wants to use you. And God only has good purpose for your life. He wants the very best for your life. You remember Romans 8, 28? You remember what it says, and we know, and we know all things, how, how many things? All things, in all things. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And God is calling you to his purpose today, his ultimate purpose. And it doesn't matter what you're going through right now. God knows, God sees, God cares, God's with you. His invisible hand is guiding you. Your perspective ought to change to know that he's there with you and that he is fulfilling his ultimate purpose for your life in whatever you're going through right now. God's calling you to his ultimate purpose. You say, Pastor Randy, what does that mean, God's ultimate purpose? What does that mean for my life? Let me, let me end by just telling you what God's purpose for your life is. The Bible makes it so very clear. Even our passage today makes it so, so very clear. You, uh, that verse in Romans 8, 28 makes it so very clear what God's purpose is. Here's the first purpose of God for your life, not just for the life of Joseph, God's purpose for your life, the first purpose is God wants you to know him. He wants you to know him. That's his purpose for your life. Nothing in life makes sense apart from God. God created you to have fellowship with him. He knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he wants you to know him. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. And that's when things began to work for the good to those who love him, who know him, who are called according to his purpose. God wants, God wants you to know him. And the second thing, he wants you to obey him. That's God's purpose for your life. God's the ultimate parent who, lo who loves and is concerned about his children. And as your heavenly father, he wants you to obey him for your own good, just as an earthly parent wants you to obey. You know, parents know that a disobedient child is at risk of all sorts of bad things happening. Disobedient children get hurt, and disobedient children hurt others when they don't obey the rules, and they don't listen to their parents. Now, God's not a tyrant he doesn't want you to obey him because, because he wants to prove his dominance over you. That's what a lot of people think. Oh, God, he just thinks he's so dominant. He could do whatever he wants. He wants to prove it. That's not why God wants you to obey his rules. God wants you to obey his rules for the same reason a parent wants their children to obey their rules. God's far too loving to be a tyrant. And, of course, he's an all-powerful God that holds the power of life and death, but he chooses to reveal himself to you and me as a loving heavenly father. That's God. God is love. And when we obey God, we're putting ourselves in his watch care. We're saying, okay, God, as a loving heavenly father, you know what's best for my life. When we obey him, when we keep his commands, all ends well. You know, before King David died, he gave his son Solomon some wise advice in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Just listen to what King, Sol uh, King, so uh, King David gave Solomon, his son, uh, the advice that he gave him. He said this, observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations, as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. That's what King David told Solomon. 
No wonder Solomon was so wise. He listened to his father. And his father said, what you need to do is obey your heavenly father. You need to obey God. And it's God's will that you obey him because he wants you to prosper. That's what David told Solomon, so that you may prosper in whatever you do and wherever you go. When we listen to God and when we obey God, we live our best life. We live the full and meaningful life that God has for us. God wants you to know him. God wants you to obey him because he wants you to prosper and he only has good purpose for your life. He wants you to know him. He wants you to obey him. And finally, God wants you to trust him. I mean really trust him. And that's what we learn from all the but gods that you find in the Bible is we learn to trust God. You can trust that God is working even when you don't see it. You can trust that God is working even when you don't feel it. Trust him. His unseen hand is guiding all things in your life to work toward his ultimate purpose. Trust him. Trust God. And that's really the essence of what being a Christian is all about. If you were going to sum up, say, what is it to be a Christian? Well, being a Christian means trusting God. Trusting God. That's the story of the Bible in a nutshell. Psalm 31, verse 14, David said, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. Over and over again, the Psalms tell us to trust God. Trust in him at all times. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust God, story of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2. Isaiah said, surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. And in Romans chapter 15 and verse 3, it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. God's ultimate purpose is for you to know him and for you to obey him and for you to trust him. The providence of God is with us this morning. It is by no accident that you came here today. It's by no accident that your life led you right here today because there's something about what's going on here today that God wanted to use in your life. Maybe it's that you need to know him. And if you don't know him, I plead with you today his unseen hand has been guiding you anyway, and he led you here today, and today needs to be the day that you commit your life to him, to know him, to have a personal relationship with him. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Is that you today? Do you need to know him today? You can know him today. You can have a personal relationship. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you do that today? Maybe you're here today and you say, well, Pastor, I've already done that. I already know him. I'm his child. I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Well, let me ask you then. Maybe God wanted you to hear you need to obey him. That's his purpose for your life. Is there any area of your life where you're not obeying him? You say, are you going to make me come down and tell everybody that I'm not obeying him? No. You don't have to tell us. Tell him. Say, God, I'm sorry. If we confess our sin... He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness in our life. Do you need to obey him today? What's that, what's that look like for you to obey him today? You say, well, I'm not doing anything. Well, maybe that's the disobedience. Maybe you're supposed to be doing something. It's not what you're doing, it's what you're not doing that's disobeying God. Hey, and maybe it's some of us today, and God wanted you to hear what you need to do is trust him. Trust him, even when it doesn't make sense. Even in the dark, even when you don't see it, even when you don't feel it, to trust that his invisible hand is guiding your life and he's working out all things for your good. <laughs> see, Joseph said, what you meant for harm, but God meant it for good, to work everything good. That's what God wants to do in your life. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. Lord, continue to speak to us. Help us as we 
as we look to you for all of life. Lord, we want to know you. We want to obey you. We want to trust you more and more in our lives. Would you be glorified? Thank you for the but gods of the Bible that what others mean for our harm, you mean for our good. In Jesus' name, amen.